a reading from the Epistle to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Here ends the reading. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I think many of us have experienced turning points in our lives, and I know I have, and I can look back on a few as being truly significant. One of the ones that really stands out for me happened in the late 80s. I had been ordained for a few years, was already working in the parish, and I was beginning to transition to think about going on to further graduate theological study. And as I was doing that, uh, Bill Moyers uh, put on PBS uh, a series with Joseph Campbell called The Power of Myth. I was just beginning to come into my own as an interpreter of scripture, and as I listened to those interviews, I found that my feet were being knocked out from under me, and a whole new way of looking at scripture and our sacred stories was being presented to me. As I look back at what Joseph Campbell was saying, he was mirroring very much what we heard Richard Rohr say in the book we read as a congregation last year, Falling Upward, that there are kind of two stages that we live through in human life. And sacred story plays a role in each of those stages of life. In the first stage of life, uh, sacred story teaches us that we are part of a greater whole, that we live within the realm of divinity, which is greater than us, that we live within the realm of community, and sacred story in this age of our lives teaches us to live with compassion. And then there is the second half of life journey, where we journey away from building our towers and building our community to letting it go. And in this stage of life, sacred story teaches us to give with generosity, to move aside and allow other people room at the table, to let go of the things and the people we love most dearly, and to even let go of ourselves as we embrace the inevitability of our death with grace. And as you look at the gospel with that kind of overlay, all of a sudden, the parables of Jesus aren't just simple morality plays uh, depicting right and wrong or virtue and sin, but that they become stories of wisdom that teach us to live in the center of God's heart, that teach us to live with compassion. And those stories also teach us how to surrender, how to let our lives go and give our lives into the hands of God without fear as we near our own personal ends. Another thing that Joseph Campbell talked about in uh, that series was purpose. And inevitably, uh, the, the time came when Bill Moyers talked about that often quoted uh, axiom of Joseph Campbell's that everyone should live their bliss, should find their bliss and live it out. Living out one's bliss is uh, easily misunderstood, as easily misunderstood as Augustine saying of love God and do as you please. 
When Joseph Campbell said to his students, follow your bliss, many people misunderstood him to think that he was embracing sort of a hedonistic idea of life, to, to find whatever gives you pleasure and just live life that way in, in a silly superficiality. So many people sort of took that as the way he was saying it, that he is reputed to have said, I wish I had said, follow your blisters. But really for Joseph Campbell, following one's bliss is really the product of an alignment between personhood and purpose. And so what Joseph Campbell was encouraging his students to do was to search deep inside of them for their purpose and to live that out with authenticity and alignment with their personality. That's not an easy thing to do. I think of myself and the many jobs that I have had, and I wonder, have I found my purpose? Have I found my bliss? Certainly, I've worked as an auto plant assembly line worker. I've worked as a security guard on campus on the night shift. I've held every job in church from sexton to senior minister. And when church was too much, I even worked in a professional kitchen. In every single one of those circumstances, I met people I would have not met otherwise. And I met people who became encouragers, mentors, people who stretched me, people who were adversaries, who forced me to grow in ways I did not anticipate. And in each one of these places and in each one of these circumstances, I became more than I was at the beginning. But can I say that I have found my bliss. Many of you know that I am passionate about fly fishing. And for me, fly fishing is a profound metaphor to describe the realities that we experience in spirituality that at some point become ineffable. Spirituality always reaches a, a point where words fail to encompass the experience of the divine. And fly fishing is a way for me to begin to talk about those in ways and in images that can make sense for other people. And I hope a week from now that I will have my fly line in a main river. But is that really my bliss? Somehow, I don't think so. I suspect that following my bliss is going to be returning to scholarship to re-enter that great body of Christian thought and theology that we have accumulated over 2,000 years, but this time, not doing it as someone in their 30s at the very beginning of their career at the, in the church, but someone having 40 years of ministry behind them, of having experienced some hard knocks as well as some successes. And in these times of questioning, to sift through that treasury of ideas and begin to elicit for us what wisdom might be for us in our times. Maybe a few years before I can get back to that, given everything that we are going through. But I suspect that that's where I'm headed. What about for you? What is your bliss? Are you living a life where your personhood and your purpose are aligned? Or do you feel like you are spinning your wheels and getting nowhere? I think purpose goes beyond simply individuals. I think if individuals have purpose, then groups of individuals have purpose as well. And as you look at the theology of the church over the centuries, in every age, in every place, there is no lack of purpose statements. Maybe the one of the ones we are most familiar that comes out of the Reformation in the 16th century is one that Martin Luther actually formulated. And he said, the church is that place. The church finds its true purpose and lives out its purpose when it preaches the gospel rightly and duly administers the sacraments. Now, we may say, yeah, obviously. Well, we've been living out that purpose for the last 500 years, and it has become a comfortable set of purpose statements for us. 
But bear in mind that when Luther put that statement together, priests were largely illiterate. Priests could not write a sermon, let alone read one. Preaching became an important mark for the truth and the vitality of the church. And the sacraments and the rites of the church were not manifestations of God's free grace for all, but were put up for sale by the church for a price. You've heard the term pay to play. Well, back in the 16th century, for Luther, it might have been pay to pray. But we have lived out that purpose so well that it has become ingrained in us to the point that when in recent years we began seeing a trickle of people leaving the church that eventually turned into a cascade of people leaving the church, we had forgotten how to ask the question, what is the purpose of the church? And for these last many years, we have been wrestling with that question. What is our purpose? As we try to realign staff, realign programs, realign our budget, figure out what our priorities are in a never-ending sequence of questioning. Maybe recently we have been given a gift. When we went into social distancing with COVID-19, everything about church came to a crashing halt. And I remember that week in between our last worship service in our sanctuary, which quite honestly felt more like a funeral service, and the first Zoom service we had the following week, which was utterly chaotic, wondering how on earth are we going to continue to be the church with authenticity? What are we going to do how are we going to be and act in this time of physical distancing? And back then, we only thought it was going to last a few weeks, two months at the most. And as we began living into that reality, a couple of things began percolating to the surface. First, we identified worship is the center of Christian experience. For it is in worship that we no long, that we not not only live in the center of God and are conscious about living in the center of God's heart, but we also hear our sacred stories that move us to live our life with compassion. And as we began reflecting on that, we began to realize, you know, the sense of community that we have in this congregation must not be lost. And so we began putting together ways to keep in touch with each other and to communicate with each other and to make sure that we were touching base to find out what the needs of people were so that we could continue to live with compassion toward each other within our sacred context as congregation, as sacred community. And it wasn't long after that before we heard a knocking on our door from our mission partners who were suffering because not only had their need increased in terms of the people they were serving, but the funds they were receiving began to diminish as people's livelihoods began uh, being threatened and people began giving less money. And so we found ourselves stepping up and giving out. Do you hear those movements from Richard War, from Joseph Campbell, about the purpose of sacred story? It's exactly the same. We live conscious that we are part of a greater divine whole, that we live with the consciousness that we are also called into community, and that we are to live with compassion towards the members of our community. And as we learn the lessons of life and how to live in the center of God's heart and how to live with compassion, that we learn to let go, to move over, to give generously, that other people may be able to join this blessed community. What is our purpose as a church? We have been given the gift of almost a clean slate 
of having everything in church come to a crashing halt so that we can reflect on this question without the noisy din of being compulsive about continuing ongoing program to ask the critical question, what is our purpose? And are we living our purpose in alignment with who we are as God's people and experiencing bliss and spreading that bliss and blessedness to all we touch. We have an opportunity to live with purpose into our future, to define our future as a congregation, instead of letting the future define us uncritically. And as we begin the journey of gathering together again in person, and restarting our programs as we begin to enter the fall season. May we live conscious of our purpose, asking the critical question and seeking that blissful alignment between who we are and who we are called to be. May God grace us with God's presence as we continue this journey. Amen.